Hi everyone, it's Mr. Marks here. I'm going to continue reading from Ramona Quimby, Age 8, by Beverly Clearly. Anyway, we left off last time. Um, we we're reading uh, the chapter where Ramona is over at Howie Kemp's house. She's at Howie's house, and she's not too thrilled because she's got to hang out with Willa Jean. Anyway, so now... Willa Jean, Mrs. Kemp was shocked. What a thing to say about your little friend. Her little friend being Bruce, who doesn't wee-wee in the sandbox at school. Ramona was not shocked. She understood that there must be a second Bruce at Willa Jean's nursery school, a Bruce who did wee-wee in the sandbox. As things turned out, Ramona was saved from being a dog by the arrival of a small boy whose mother led him out the car and watched him reach the front door before she drove off. Hmm, wonderful parenting. Willa Jean ran to let him in and introduced him as Ramona expected. This is Bruce, who doesn't wee-wee in the sandbox. Bruce looked pleased with himself. Mrs. Kemp felt a need to apologize for a granddaughter. Willa Jean doesn't mean what she says. But I don't wee-wee in the sandbox, said Bruce. I wee-wee in the... Never mind, Bruce, said Mrs. Kemp. Now, what are you three going to play? Ramona was trapped. Dress up, was Willa Jean's prompt answer. She dragged, she dragged from the corner a carton piled with old clothes. Willa Jean shoved one of her father's old jackets at Bruce and handed him an old hat and her blue flippers. She unwound the curtain from her shoulders, draped it over her head, and tied it under her chin. Then she hung a piece of old sheet from her shoulders. Satisfied with herself, she handed a torn shirt to Ramona, who put it on only because Mrs. Kemp was watching. There, said Willa Jean, satisfied. I'll be Miss Mousie, the beautiful bride, and Bruce is the frog, and Ramona is Uncle Rat, and now we're going to have a wedding party. Ramona did not want to be Uncle Rat. Mr. Frog would a wooing go, sang Willa Jean. Bruce joined in. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Apparently this song was popular in nursery school. Ramona, mm-hmm, too. Speaking of which, uh, the, the song they're referring to is A Froggy Win a Courtin', which is a... Uh, Bob Dylan song. I'll have to ask my dad about that because uh, he's a big Bob Dylan fan. Anyway, moving on. Say it, Willa Jean ordered Bruce. Willa Jean, will you marry me? sang Bruce. Willa Jean stamped her foot. Not Willa Jean, Miss Mousie. Bruce started over. Miss Mousie, will you marry me? he sang. Yes, if Uncle Rat will agree, sang Willa Jean. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm, 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 hummed all three. The two nursery school children looked to Ramona for the next line. Since she did not remember the words used by Uncle Rat to give Mr. Frog permission to marry Miss Mousie, she said, sure, go ahead. Okay, said Willa Jean, now we will have the wedding party. She seized Bruce and, and Ramona by the hand. Take Bruce's other hand, she ordered Ramona. Ramona found Bruce's hand inside the long sleeve of his old coat. His hand was sticky. Now we'll dance in a circle, directed Willa Jean. Ramona skipped, Willa Jean pranced, and Bruce flapped. They danced in a circle, tripping on Miss Mousie's train and wedding veil and stumbling over Mr. Frog's slippers until Willa Jean gave the next order. Now we'll all fall down. Ramona merely dropped to her knees while Willa Jean and Bruce collapsed in a heap laughing. Above their laughter and the sound of the television, Ramona heard the shouts of the boys outside as they rode their bicycles up and down the street. She wondered how much longer she would have to wait until her mother came to rescue her. She hoped she would arrive before Howie's parents came home from work. Willa Jean scrambled to her feet. Let's play it again, she said, beaming, convinced of her beauty in her wedding veil. Over and over the three sang, danced, and fell down. As the game went on and on, Ramona grew bored and varied the words she used to give Mr. Frog permission to marry Miss Mousie. Sometimes she said, See if I care. And sometimes she said, Yes, but you'll be sorry. Willa Jean did not notice. She was so eager to get to the party part of the game where they fell down in a heap. Still, the game went on, over and over, with no sign of Bruce and Willa Jean's tiring. Then Beezus came in with an armload of books. Hi, Beezus, said Willa Jean, flushed with laughter. You can play, too. You can be the old tomcat in the song. I'm sorry, Willa Jean, said Beezus. 
I don't have time to be the old tomcat. I have homework I have to do. She settled herself at the dining room table and opened a book. Ramona looked at Mrs. Kemp, who smiled and continued crocheting. Why did Ramona have to play with Willa Jean when Beezus did not? Because she was younger, that was why. Ramona was overwhelmed by the unfairness of it all. Because she was younger, she always had to do things she did not want to do. Go to bed earlier, wear Beezus' outgrown clothes that her mother saved for her, run and fetch because her legs were because her legs were younger and because Beezus was always doing homework. Now she had to get along with Willa Jean. Her whole family was depending on it, and Beezus did not. Once more, Ramona looked at her book of fairy tales, waiting on the chair beside the front door. And as she looked at its worn cover, she had an inspiration. Maybe her idea would work, and maybe it wouldn't. It was worth a try. Willa Jean, you and Bruce will have to excuse me now, Ramona said in her pliest voice. I have to do my sustained silent reading. Out of the corner of her eye, she watched Mrs. Kemp. Okay, Willa Jean was not only impressed by a phrase she did not understand, she had Bruce to boss around. Mrs. Kemp, who was counting stitches, merely nodded. Ramona picked up her book and settled herself in the corner of the couch. Beezus caught her eye, and the two sisters exchanged conspirational looks, smiles while Willa Jean and Bruce, now minus Uncle Rat, raced happily around in a circle, screaming with joy and singing, She'll be coming round the mountain when she comes. Ramona blissfully read herself off into the land of princesses, kings, and clever younger, youngest sons, satisfied that the Quimby's had a clever young daughter who was doing her part. Chapter 3. The Hard-Boiled Egg Fad A fad is anything that's popular. With all four members of the living of the family leaving at different times in different directions, mornings were flurried in the Quimby household. On the days when Mr. Quimby had an eight o'clock class, he left early in the car. Beezus left next because she walked to school and because she wanted to stop for Mary Jane on the way. Ramona was third to leave. She enjoyed these last few minutes alone with her mother now that Mrs. Quimby no longer reminded her she must be nice to Willa Jean. Did you remember to give me a hard boiled egg in the Did you remember to give me a hard boiled egg in my lunch like I asked? Ramona inquired one morning. This week hard boiled eggs were popular with third graders, a fad started by Yard Ape, who sometimes brought his lunch. Last week the fad had been individual bags of corn chips. Kinda of reminds me of the fads of like Takis and Hot Cheetos. You guys know what fads are. So in this book, hard boiled eggs are the fad. Ramona had been left out of that fad because her mother objected to spending money on junk food. Surely her mother would not object to a nutritious hard-boiled egg. Yes, I remember the hard-boiled egg, you little rabbit, said Mrs. Quimby. I'm glad you have finally learned to like them. Ramona did not feel it necessary to explain to her mother that she still did not like hard-boiled eggs, not even when they had been dyed for Easter. Neither did she like soft-boiled eggs because she didn't, did not like the slippery, slithery food. Ramona liked deviled eggs, but deviled eggs were not the fad, a lot, at least not this week. On the bus, Ramona and Susan compared lunches. Each was happy to discover that the other had a hard-boiled egg, and both were eager for lunch time to come. While Ramona waited for lunch period, the school turned out to be unusually interesting. After the class had filled out their arithmetic books, math, Mrs. Whaley handed each girl I'm sorry, Mrs. Whaley handed each child a glass jar containing about two inches of wet blue substance. She explained that it was oatmeal dyed blue. Ramona was the first to say, yuck. Most people made faces, and Yard Ape made a gagging noise. Okay, kids, quiet down, said Mrs. Whaley. When the room was quiet, she explained for science they were going to study fruit flies. The blue oatmeal contained fruit fly larvae. And why do you think the oatmeal is blue? she asked. Several people thought the blue dye was some of the most several people thought the blue dye was some sort of food for the larva, vitamins maybe. Marcia suggested the oatmeal was dyed blue so the children wouldn't think it was good to eat. Everybody laughed at this guess. Who would ever think cold oatmeal was good to eat? Yard ape came up with the right answer. The oatmeal was dyed blue so the larva could be seen. And so they could. Little white specks. As the class went over their desks, 
Making labels for their jars, Ramona wrote her name on her slip of paper and added age 8, which she always wrote after her signa signature. Signature is when you sign your name. Then she drew tiny fruit flies around it before she pasted the label on her very own jar of blue oatmeal and fruit fly larva. Now she had a jar of pets. Larvas, the babies, by the way, like little worms. That's a really neat label, Ramona, said Mrs. Whaley. Ramona understood that her teacher did not mean tidy when she said neat, but extra good. Ramona decided she liked Mr. Mrs. Whaley after all. The morning was so satisfactory that it passed quickly. When lunchtime came, Ramona collected her lunchbox and went off to the cafeteria where, after waiting in line for her milk, she sat at a table with Sarah, Janet, Marcia, and the other third grade girls. She opened her lunchbox, and there, tucked in a paper napkin snug between her sandwich and orange, was her hard-boiled egg smooth and perfect, the right size to fit her head. Because Ramona wanted to save the best for last, she ate the center of her sandwich, tuna fish, and poked a hole in her orange so that she could suck out the juice. Third graders did not peel their oranges. At last it was time for the egg. There is a number of ways of cracking eggs. The most popular, and the real reason for bringing an egg to, to school, was knocking the egg against one's head. There were two ways of doing it by a lot of timid little raps or one big whack. Sarah was a rapper. Ramona, like Art Ape, was a Yard Ape, was a whacker. She took a firm hold of her egg, waited until everyone at her table was watching, and whack! She found herself with a handful of crumbled shell and something cool and slimy running down her face. Everyone at Ramona's table gasped. Ramona needed a moment to realize what had happened. Her egg was raw. Her mother had not boiled her egg at all. She tied. She tried to brush the yellow yolk and slithery white out of her hair and away from her face, but she only succeeded in making her hands eggy. Her eyes filled with tears of anger, which she tried to brush away with, with her wrists. The gasps at her table turned into giggles. From another table, Ramona caught the glimpse of Yard Ape grinning at her. Marcia, a tall girl who always tried to be motherly, said, it's all right, Ramona. I'll take you to the bathroom and help you wash off the egg. Ramona was not one bit grateful. You go away, she said, ashamed of being so rude. She did not want this third grade girl treating her like a baby. The teacher, who was supervising lunch period, came over to see what the co commotion was all about. Marcia gathered up the paper napkins from the lunch boxes at the table and handed them to the teacher, who tried to sop up the egg. Unfortunately, the napkins did not absorb A very well. Instead, they smeared yolk and white around the Ramona's hair. Her face felt stiff as egg white began to dry. If you ever try to clean up egg, it's not easy. Take her to the office, the teacher said to Marcia. Mrs. Larson will help her. Come on, Ramona, said Marcia, as if Ramona were in kindergarten. She put her hand on Ramona's shoulder, because Ramona's hands were too eggy to touch. Ramona jerked away. I can go by myself. With that reply, she ran out of the cafeteria. She was so angry that she was able to ignore the giggles and a few sympathetic looks from the other children. Ramona was mad at herself for following the fad. She was furious with Yardick for grinning at her. Most of all, she was angry with her mother for not boiling the egg in the first place. By the time she reached the office, Ramona's face felt as stiff as a mask. Ramona almost ran into Mr. Whitman, the principal, which would have upset him, her even more. He was someone Ramona always tried to avoid ever since Beezus had told her that the way to remember how to spell the kind of principal that was the principal of a school was to remember that the word ended in P-A-L, not P-L-E, because the principal was her pal. Ramona did not want the principal to be her pal. She wanted him to mind his own business, aloof and important in his office. Mr. Whitman must have felt the same way because he stepped, almost jumped, quickly aside. Mrs. Larson, the school secretary, took one look at Ramona, sprang from her desk and said, Well, you need a little help, don't you? Ramona nodded, grateful to Mrs. Larson for behaving as if eggy third graders walked into her office every day. The secretary led her into a tiny room equipped with a cot, waste wash basin, and a toilet that adjoined the office. All right, guys, I'm going to stop there for today, and then I'll continue reading the rest of the chapter tomorrow or the next video. See you soon.